So if you were to reflect to your younger self, would you still do your PhD? Hey, you know, I'm going to build this A, B, C, D, and if you've got the money and you think it'll give you an income. So it Hello, Dr. Alex, and welcome to PhD Hard Talk. Um, hello. Thank you so much uh, for your time today. Um, so today we're here to find out about your research and, you know, your choices after you have finished your PhD. Could you please um, let us know what you've done for your PhD, please? Hi, Kevin. So for my PhD, I'm um, going to start by using loads of technical terms and then I'm going to explain them. Uh, just Brilliant. That's probably the easiest way to do this. So uh, my uh, PhD looked at something called electron backscatter diffraction, uh, which is an analytical technique that is used in a scanning electron microscope. Said so there'd be a lot of technical words. Um, <laughs> and and uh, that is... Um, that is then used to look at the arrangement of atoms in the surface of a crystalline material, such as a metal, uh, and determine what's known as their orientation or phase. Uh, and then you can reconstruct what those atoms are doing on the surface of various metals. Uh, and I've also had a little bit of a go at designing something for an SEM. So I'll go through all of that and explain what that means in English instead of jargon. Um, so a crystalline material, I'll start with that is a material like a metal where all of the atoms, uh, which are the things that make up the material, are arranged in a regular pattern. So two of the most common ones are hex uh, hexagonal or cubic. And what that means is if you imagine, uh, I've got this, this hexagon here and this, this cube here, if you imagine that on each of the points of this hexagon there is an atom, don't drop it. <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> uh, imagine that on each of the points of these hexagon, this hexagon there's an atom, or on each of the points of this cube there is an atom. That is how we uh, it would sort of be repeating loads of loads of sort of squares, one after the other, like this, or loads of hexagons. Um, and that is what we mean by a crystal, uh, a crystalline material. So it's basically a material which has a regular arrangement of atoms. And these are just two of the most common ones. They can get more complicated. Um, so you can have them sort of twist around like that, I guess, like that, and that, that makes things more tricky. Um, but for the most part, we'll talk with cubes and uh, hexagons because that's the easiest. So that's what a crystalline material is. A crystalline material is just a, uh, a material that has atoms that arrange themselves in regularly. So this technique, EBSD, electron backscatter diffraction, shoots electrons at the surface of one of these crystalline uh, materials, usually a metal, could be silicon, could be a rock flow, could be uh, even ice as well is, is crystalline. Um, so you shoot electrons at it and the electrons interact with the atoms in this cube and they diffract out and they make a nice pretty pattern on the screen. And it's my job to work out what that pattern on the screen means the atoms here are doing. Um, so if I talk about something like uh, orientation, if you say you've got two cubes sort of um, like this, one might be like that with respect to the other one or like this. And, and the idea is to try and work out what this one is doing with respect to this one. Uh, or there's also something called crystal phase, which might be, is it a hex hexagon and is it a, or is it a square? And the idea is to determine what shape the atoms are in and also how they um, are oriented with respect to each other. So that's what the idea of an experiment is. Uh, and it takes place in something called a scanning electron microscope. Now, what that means is um, it's a microscope that uses electrons instead of light. Uh, and what it is, if you've got your sample, it takes a look mm -hmm. at this bit, and then it takes a look at this bit, and this bit, and this bit, and it moves along like that. So it scans the electrons across the sample like that, and you build up, if you imagine at each point you've got sort of like a cube, so you have a cube at this point, and that bit, and this bit, and this bit. And by, by moving the beam across the sample, you get to build up what all of the atoms are doing, as opposed to just the atoms in one spot are doing. And that's sort of like the fundamentals of the technique. So you basically stick 
uh, a sample inside a very expensive microscope, you shoot it with electrons, and then you look at the pretty pictures that come out of it. And it's the pictures that I'm most concerned about. So that's what my PhD looks at. So you might get a pattern that looks, uh, in fact, I'll show you a darker pen than that, there it is. So you might get a pattern that looks something like, and if I was prepared, I would have drawn one of these earlier. Um, there you go. So you might get a pattern that looks something like this, and you would have to work out what that actually means. Okay. So the way that this is made is the electrons shoot in and they interact, and then they bounce off, and they bounce off in line with the, uh, with the faces of this cube, or with the, with the faces, of, faces of this hexagon. So they'll, they'll be like this, like that. Now what that means is if you've got your screen here mm -hmm. and you've got your atoms here, if they rotate, you'll see that it moves up and down where that line is on the screen. So the idea is if you can identify what these lines are, you can then work out what shape it is and also how that shape is oriented with respect to the screen. And then you can do the same for all of the different shapes and then you know what the atom's doing on the metal. So normally what we do when we're looking at these is we do something called a hoof transform, which turns this into something that looks a lot like that. Okay. Uh, you can see the dots there, which yeah, are very easy to find. Um, I'm not going to go into how that's done. If, you, if you're interested, you can look up, look up the hoof transform. That's H-O-U-G-H. Um, and it will go from that to that. And each of these dots represents one of these lines. And then you can go and you can look up what all of those dots mean in something called a lookup table. You can sort of like go, if we've got this, this is what we would expect. And you compare it and then you get back what these lines are and you can work out what the, um, what, what the atoms are doing. Now, the thing is that's really, that, that's, that works really well for easy shapes but for slightly mm -hmm. harder shapes, it doesn't quite work as well. So if it's sort of twisted like this, so if instead of being a nice square, it goes sort of down at diagonals like this, um, that makes things a lot more complicated. And that's where uh, my PhD comes in. What I do is I take a pattern that looks like this and I make hundreds of them. I have like a small stack of patterns here like this. And I basically mm -hmm. compare and then compare the next one and compare the next one uh, until, uh, until we've got one that matches. Now, the stack of patterns that I make, I know everything about them. I know if they're squares or if they're hexagons or if they're whatever shape. I know what, I know where the screen is in relation to where that cube is. So in theory, I know where the lines on the screen should be, you can see that the lines would move if, uh, if the square moves. Now that means that um, in theory, if they match or if mm -hmm. they're both match, that's a good starting point to say, well, we don't know, but we think that it's in this orientation. We think that it looks like this. And then I do um, a little clever step that if, if I say, well, I've got this image uh, that is close, and that's, that's saying it's like this, but in mm -hmm. reality, it's, it's sort of like that. All I've right. made a little bit of code that will nudge my pattern so that it goes around and then it sort of tips it forward a little bit like this. And it goes, ah, that's a much better match. That's the orientation that it's in. So that's what my sort of first two years have, have been spent doing, uh, making that algorithm, testing it, and also getting it published. My work managed to get published in a journal called Ultra Microscopy. It's also uh, it's also on a free print website called Archive, um, mm -hmm. which is nice. Um, then I've spent a little bit of time modifying it. So instead of saying, well, they're all cubes or they're all hexagons, what if there's cubes and hexagons? Uh, and then also looking at cases where it might be twisted, like instead of being twisted for quite a lot, just sort of twisted a little tiny bit so that it's almost mm -hmm. but not quite a cube, 
uh, and that does some things with the patterns that make them ever so slightly off. Uh, and it's testing it to do with, with that, which is um, where some of the problems lie. Uh, and the last thing I did is I designed a special bit of equipment to go inside the microscope to get really good quality patterns. So my, uh, my algorithm works better. So that's a very sort of quick turbocharged, haven't prepared anything, <laughs> type, um, overview of my PhD and my research. So that's what I've been doing. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much for, for sharing that information. No now, I've, I've understood what you've said, but I'm thinking of people who've no interest in terms of what you do. And you've explained it to the best of your ability. And I've understood. I mean, I'm not really a scientist and with maths, it's, it's, it's a struggle. How does it actually benefit um, the community at large in terms of your research? So this is what's known as a uh, testing technique. It's an analytical technique. It looks at, mm -hmm. it looks at, um, it basically looks at things is, is what it does. And the reason that's useful is let's say you go to Rolls Royce, oh, well, let's say Rolls Royce have, has said, right, we've got this new engine that we want to test. Can mm -hmm. we use this metal in it? And they go, well, I don't know. Let's do some tests. And I'll give it to someone who works with me and that person will break it. They'll, you know, they'll take this nice shiny new metal and they'll break it in, in various different ways um, that will you know, simulate various different bits and pieces in an engine. They'll heat it up and see if it melts. They'll stretch it, they'll pull it, they'll bend it, they'll put it under loads of pressure and they'll see what that does. And then they'll give it to me and they'll say, well, it's broken here. Why is it broken there? And, you know, is that safe? Uh, and then someone like me will take it and they'll do uh, this on it. And it'll be one of many things that they do to look at it. So they'll uh they'll do ebsd they'll do um uh, something called x x-ray uh energy uh, energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy which is uh related to this which looks at what sort of in there sort of imperfections uh and that, that will be done in conjunction with what i've been doing and they'll say and that will say well it's broken because the atoms are doing this or it looks or this is what's going on on the surface here that means that yes you can avoid this or no or you can use this or no you shouldn't use this or yes you can use it if you do it like this so that this happens that's one application so testing sort of jet engines um the materials used in nuclear reactors steel used in buildings all of it will be tested using this sort of uh technique um the most novel use of it is for making drinks cans you know like the coca-cola cans like this um yeah. where they work is they have a nice big sheet of aluminium and a, mm -hmm. a big sort of press comes down and sort of pushes out the bottom bit of the can and then they fill it and they put the cap on top of it and they they seal it to be able to get the depth that you need um in the aluminium so that so that it doesn't break or, or rip or tear or anything like that all of the atoms have to be arranged in a certain phase at a certain orientation uh, and if they're not it, it will you, you'll basically just punch a hole in it as opposed to punching a can in it um so yeah that's like the the most sort of everyday use you need to make sure that the aluminium that is used in your drink cans will work Brilliant. Yeah. Well, I didn't know that. That's um, really good to, to, to know. Uh, so just a quick question. What is EBSD? Because that went over my head. Yeah. So it's electron backscattered diffraction. Okay, so, brilliant. Uh, yeah, uh, basically, if you imagine you've got your atoms arranged sort of like that in your, in your material, put a few more, put, we'll put a few more in and we'll make them a bit darker just so that people can see. Good thing I brought a pen down, isn't it? <laughs> there we go. Right. So they're, they're atoms, they're sitting nicely in your material. Uh, and you want to do an EBSD experiment. What happens in the experiment is you shoot in a beam, an electron beam there like that. And it gets close to say uh, this atom here. Right. And it will interact with that atom. That atom will make it slow down. It might hit the atom. It might come close to the atom uh, and, and it will interact with it. And it's 
direction will change. And that then sends it to another atom. So its direction changes again. And that sends it to another atom, which makes its direction change again and again. So eventually, so basically your electron that you've shot in goes in and jumps around all of these atoms and then comes back out again. Um, and it's the electron that comes back out is now known as a backscattered electron. Um, and if various mathematical conditions are met, it becomes a diffracting electron and that's electron backscattered diffraction. Basically, it's a fancy way of saying you bounce an electron around loads of atoms for a little bit and then see what comes out. Is, is, is it in a nutshell? Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. So no in problem. terms of understanding um, why you chose to do what you do, could you take us through that so I understand why you've made the choice to, to look at atoms or, yeah. you know, <laughs> what got you so interested in, in atoms of all things? Not that um, it's a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, um, my criterion for a PhD where I wanted something that involved physics but was very maths heavy and very programming heavy. So throughout my uh, undergraduate, so my, my undergraduate was in physics. Uh, so I did an integrated master's in physics uh, and I learned how to code uh, as, a, as an undergraduate. They, they taught us how to do C programming and I really enjoyed the computer coding aspect of it. And I've always enjoyed the mathematical aspects of it and my master's project was looking at the growth rate of a supermassive black hole and that was basically coding loads of equations into a computer and seeing what came out and and recording it and i really enjoyed the process of taking maths and and applying it to code and i was sort of applying for phds that had a lot of that had science involved in them but were very maths and coding heavy and it just so happened that while I was looking for a PhD, one of my friends who I uh, met as an undergrad was doing a PhD at Imperial College. And she said, oh, I know someone who wants someone with a physics background who can code, who likes maths. Can I introduce you to him? And I was like, yeah, sure. Um, so I got introduced to uh, Dr. Ben Britton, who then became my supervisor. Uh, who's recently moved to Canada, actually. He's now, he, he was... Um, He'd just been promoted to, I think it was reader at Imperial College. And then he took a job as an assistant professor or associate professor at the University of British Columbia in Canada with tenure. Um, so he's, uh, yeah, he's just moved. He's just emigrated in the middle of a pandemic. Um, <laughs> you know, anyway, uh, I got introduced to Dr. Ben Britton, who uh, was speaking to me a little bit about the project and about what it entailed. And I was like, sounds a lot, sounds like a lot of fun. Sounds like maths, sounds like coding to me, the science fair. And, and so the science was almost secondary, really. Like I enjoy science, but I, I enjoyed the, the mathematical and the coding aspect of it more. Um, so that's, I, I sort of fell into it really, to be honest. It's, um, but it was a lot of fun and it's been very rewarding. I've, I've got to, I've got to do some coding and I've got to do some maths. So. <laughs> Brilliant. So in terms of um, something that you've mentioned there, and I think I've asked a, a lot of people in regards to networking and the benefits of networking. So from your point of view, would you say that um, networking is beneficial if you're looking for a PhD, a yes. funded PhD to be specific? Net networking is important everywhere. If you're looking for a PhD, if you're looking for a funded PhD, if you've got an idea and you're looking for a supervisor, if you're looking for a job, if you're looking for a course, if you want to learn something, if you want something done, knowing someone who can put you in touch with someone who can do that thing or knowing someone who wants something that, like that or can put you in touch with somebody. Yeah, networking, I, I would say, is essential in pretty much anything that you're going to do in, in life, not just PhD, but in life. Um, so in between my master's and my... PhD, I was a professional magician uh, and the, I, I met the guy who started giving me, who, who runs the agency through other magicians that I know. Um, I met the guy who, who I met Ben, who uh, supervised me through someone else that I knew. Uh, networking is, 
I would say essential. Go to conferences, meet people, talk to people, go to go on Facebook groups, go on Twitter, go on, you know, go go places and get involved in the academic world. Um, and honestly, like I quite often see people who are applying for PhDs tweeting, oh, what advice can you give for someone who's applying for a PhD? And my advice is email the, email the person you want to supervise you, email your super, email your potential supervisors, talk to them, get to know them, and then, you know, and, and get in that way so that they have an idea of who you are when they see your application appear on your on their computer and that it's not then just another name, it's not just another number. Uh, so yeah, um, networking is vital, I would say. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. Can't do it so in, about it. it. Brilliant. So in terms of building relationships, and I think you've touched on it there, would you say that is essential um, when you are in your journey from start to finish and to maintain those relationships when you've finished your PhD as well? Yeah, again, uh, it's following on from that point. Um, but in my head, a PhD is a team effort. Eventually, it essentially, it is you who sits down and writes your thesis, but you work as a group, you work in a, in a, in a, in a research team, as it were, and you've got your PhD supervisor who's going to be the leader of that team. And then he's got, he or she is going to be supervising loads of other PhD students who are all going to have different skills and different specialities. And your supervisor isn't always going to be available. You're not always going to be able to get in touch with them. So knowing who to go to for various problems and building relationships so that you can go to people who've got problems like and not not just not just problems with oh can you do this code or this maths or i've got this problem can you help me solve it but it might be oh my, my flat was broken into last night and you know i need someone to you know i need to go and sleep on a chair i need to, you know i need someone to oh i had a really tough day my experiment didn't go as i wanted it to or my survey um or, or my my application to do this survey got denied uh you know there's, there's loads of different things that you know might happen that mean you need to have sort of like a shoulder to cry on as well as someone to help you with your phd and the whole mental side of doing a phd is something that you you know you need to have a big support network for as well it's not just it's not just for work it's everything that goes with it as well uh, so yeah building building network building relationships is just as important as well um to get you through your phd and to even get a phd in the first place it's um a very important skill to have i would say wise words so if you were to reflect to your younger self would you still do your phd 100 percent, yes um there's a number of reasons for that um <laughs> Firstly, I know that for myself, I've wanted a PhD since I was about 15. Um, so I, I like being on stage. I like being a performer, which is one of the reasons why I did magic for a year. Uh, I like learning. I like science. I like teaching. You know, I, I, when I was an A-level student, I tutored one of my friends through their GCSEs uh, in maths and science because they were struggling and I really enjoyed that. And I wanted a job that I could combine all of those different bits and pieces into. And um, when I was about 15, I discovered the job university lecturer. And I was like, oh, this sounds perfect. I get paid to be on stage. I get paid to teach people on stage in, like, in big auditoriums. That's me being on stage. And I get to go and present at conferences. And I could get paid to learn. That's all research is, isn't it? It's paid learning. That's, that's you know... Mm -hmm. Uh, brilliant and then I get to teach students and I get to I get to research and I get to be on stage it sounds perfect what do I need to be a university lecturer we need a PhD fine I'm going to get one of those and when I was 15 I was just like right I'm going to go uh, I'm going to go to university I'm going to do this that and the other and um, yeah I forgot what the question was now but uh, <laughs> um I, I sort of realised early on that I wanted to do uh, a PhD and um, I think that helped. Um, what was the question again? 
So looking back, would you do your PhD? Yes, that's it. Looking back, would I do it again? Um, so that's it. That, that's the point I was coming, I was circling back to. Yes, I, I would do it again because I've wanted to do it for so long. Um, and me personally, if I'd wanted to do something for so long and didn't do everything in my power to do it, I would then feel like a failure later on in life. I would feel like I hadn't done myself justice. I would feel like I hadn't applied or at least tried to. Um, and likewise, if I'd have quit partway through, um, there's what we, we've, there's what a lot of people have referred to as the second year slump, which is where mm-hmm. like, you have a, a month or two, a few months where just nothing happens. You get stuck on a problem and it, it just stays there and, and like your progress goes and it stagnates. Um, and again, like just knowing that I'd got this far to quit, to stop would be something that I would be beating myself up with for the rest of my life. That is something that I I wouldn't want to do. But not only that, I've had, um, a load of, of amazing experiences doing a PhD that I wouldn't have had otherwise. I've been to America, I've been to the States to do conferences. I've been to Oxford and Plymouth and to various other bits and other places that I wouldn't have otherwise been to. I've made some absolutely amazing friends through doing a PhD. Met my girlfriend while I was doing a PhD, not in my PhD, but just living somewhere else. I was out and about, you know, I've I've met friends just out and about. I've met my girlfriend. I've been to uh, London's West End more times than I care to count because my PhD was in London. Um, You know, I've I've, I've explored and I've been to museums and I've been to uh, theatres and I've been to uh, to places that I otherwise wouldn't have been and I've met people that I'm very grateful for meeting. So, yes, I would 100% do a PhD again. Uh, no, I wouldn't necessarily choose to stay in academia, um, but I would definitely choose, I would definitely do a PhD again. Okay, so you've said something there that's really triggered my mind and I've got so many questions, which is no. <laughs> I wouldn't stay in academia. So could you please explain <laughs> to me in terms of <laughs> where you're going with that and why? Um, I mean, you've said some great things there. I had the word girlfriend twice, theatre yeah. twice, you know, the US, etc. So I'm just thinking to myself, why? So um, academia is not what I thought it was and it's not what I imagined it to be especially in the science I can't speak for the humanities the art side of things because that's not where my specialities are but in the sciences there's uh, a sort of publish or perish type culture you have to keep working you have to keep coming up with new ideas you have to be very careful about what you say at conferences so that people don't poach or steal your ideas and then publish it first uh you have to be very careful about who you're friends with and who you work with uh because you might want to work with someone on one project but keep them away from a different project and like so there's lots of it feels like there's lots of uh, there are some genuinely nice people in there okay but it feels like there's lots of faux pretend nice people in there as well who are just trying to get close to people to then do research with them and then steal work or, or, you know, try and, and it feels a little bit sort of cutthroat because you, there's this expectation, this pressure to keep pumping out papers, to keep pumping out research and work and new ideas. Um, there's also the job itself as, as a lecturer is not what I thought it was. I thought it would be like maybe 10% admin, uh, 90% research, no, sorry, 10% admin, 80% research, 10% teaching and, and things include, you know, I thought it would be mostly learning and a bit of teaching and a bit of admin, but it's, it's like 90% admin. It's applying for grants. It's applying for funding. It's applying for fellowships. It's putting out adverts for PhD students. It's helping PhD students coming up with new ideas, uh, publishing papers, getting papers out, organising conferences, organising trips, keeping track of your um, intellectual property, making sure that you know whose intellectual property you're using and making sure that people are properly credited. It's lots of long nights, lots of... um, Basically, you're underpaid. Long nights, underpaid. A lot of academics do 60, 70-hour weeks. Um, And I want... 
And to be good at academia, you just have to be an academic. Like my supervisor, absolutely lovely guy. I cannot say a bad word about my supervisor, but he is mm-hmm. very much an academic for first and centre. He admits it himself. Like he um, he needs to try and take weekends off more often. Um, I know a lot of, of lecturers who do mm-hmm. just do um, academia, even in their spare time. Um, and their, their idea of time off is doing the research that they want to do as opposed to the research that they're being paid to do. And, and I have other interests. I do magic. I read. I've got, a, I've got a blog. I've been entering competitions for short stories. Um, I, you know, I've, I've got loads of other interests that I enjoy, that I enjoy, that I want to pursue. And I just cannot dedicate the amount of my life that you need to dedicate to be a, a, a good academic. And also to be a lecturer, you have to go through a few postdoctoral research positions and the postdoctoral research positions are short-term contracts and you don't know where you're going to be in two, three years time. So if you're on a two-year contract in London, you can't really think about maybe trying to buy a house well, I would say in London, but maybe a bad example. How's it expensive? You get my point. If, if you're doing, yeah, I do. Let's go somewhere affordable. You're doing your postdoc in Leeds. Uh, you can't think about saving up to buy a house in Leeds because you don't know where you're going to be in two years' time because you might end up in Bath or in Amsterdam or New York or you could end up in London or you could end up somewhere else. And it's quite hard to think about settling down and starting a family or dating or doing anything beyond those two years because you then have to look for the next job um and normally to do a to do a to even apply for a lecturing position you need to have done two or three postdoctoral positions if not more so you've got they're all two-year contracts that's six years where you can't think about buying a house or starting a family and there are things that are becoming more important to me now. Uh, you know, I'm coming up to the four-year anniversary of my girlfriend. Uh, I want to start thinking about settling down, and I can't be, I can't be doing short-term two-year contracts where I might be in London one one year and then the next day I have to move to X, Y, or Z. Um, so while there are a lot of benefits, there's lots of international travel. You get to see loads of cool places. You get to meet loads of cool people. There's also downsides, which for me they outweigh the they outweigh the positives. And I don't, I'm not saying this to try and put someone off doing a PhD or even off doing an academic career. We need academics. We need people to be going and doing academia. But it's just not for me. The lifestyle isn't for me. Um, but it might be for someone else. If you don't necessarily want to settle down, if you don't necessarily want a family, uh, if going and traveling or or you don't mind moving around with someone um is 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 in your sort of you know what makes you happy your hierarchy of needs as it were then then go for it do it but Mm. it's just not for me Mm. okay brilliant so in terms of what you've mentioned there you've mentioned a lot of things Mm. um in regards to why and why one should do a PhD. Mm-hmm. I mean, when it comes to sharing ideas, um, you know, forgive me, I'm not really in your field, so I'm just trying to understand it from my from my field. Well, not from my field particularly, but from an entrepreneur's mm-hmm. mind. When you share an idea, if someone's got money or they know an angel investor, they will steal your idea and take it and, and make it theirs, you know, yeah. and you can't win in court if, you know, if there's certain legal things that you haven't done them at that moment in time mm-hmm. so just like the lady I think you know the one who owns uh, Bumble she yeah. she was with a different business previously and you know she she raised a few allegations and you know things happened the way they did but she started something else and it, it's worked out we've got Facebook as well that's another example just knowing that would you say still that it's it's still a uh, an unhealthy atmosphere to share your ideas 
Or do you think maybe it's just a part of life? I mean, just like Lion King, it's the circle of life. We, it, we eat that animal and, you know. <laughs> it, is, it is a part of life. I appreciate it's a part of life and you're, you're never going to be able to stop all mm -hmm. of your ideas being stolen. Um, but yes, I still think it is a, a toxic environment for it. I still think it is a bad place for people stealing ideas because of the amount of time that it can take to have that idea, to get the research, to get the data. So there's some people that I know, they plot graphs of a few hundred points and each one of those hundred points will have taken 10 hours in a lab to get. So there's a significant time, uh, resource, money, investment in these ideas And if you say something at a conference prematurely, or if you're talking to someone and you mention something offhand prematurely, or you share the wrong data with them and they then steal this idea, it's, it gets credited to them and not you. And that means you then might have to, you then might lose your funding. You might even lose your job because they might be publishing all of these papers to do with the work that you've done. And Uh, you then can't publish your own work because someone else has published it first and it's now their work. Um, so while I agree that it is a fact of life and it is something that people will do, um, I think that academia is a very toxic place for it and I think it's more rampant there than it is perhaps in the business world, but I also don't think that people should steal like, other people's ideas in the business world either. Uh, or being an entrepreneur, I don't, I don't think that stealing ideas is necessarily a good thing. Um, that being said, I'm very open to sharing ideas on the basis of collaboration and making something better. Copyright laws, for instance, I think are very restrictive and it restricts artists using music to do something more creative with it. Uh, Batman was created in like the 20s or something like that and the copyright on Batman is only just coming into the public domain now and that stopped loads of people who might have had loads of creative stories that they could write in, in the Batman universe that they'd not been able to do because of, of that. The Happy Birthday song, the copyright only went out, that was copyrighted to Disney until a few years ago. Um, so... Like in movies, people would always have to sing uh, for he's a jolly good fellow or something to to that uh, effect or pay Disney loads of money to use happy birthday to make it seem a bit more natural. Um, so, so while I agree that your ideas should be protected and, and whatnot, I think after a certain point, you should be able to share them. But that's how research papers work. Uh, you have your idea, you get it published in a research paper And then other people can go and run with that idea and make it better. The algorithm that I've been working on, for instance, is now public domain. Um, well, it's locked behind, it's, uh, it's public domain. Um, so if you go on archive, it's free and you can look at it, or you can go on ultra microscopy and you can pay them some money and look at the same, the same words, but all formatted nicely. Um, So, but, but someone else is now free to take my ideas and to improve them and make them better. And the code is uh, in GitHub and it's all sort of open, open source and people can now take it and make it better. But it's accredited to me because I'm the one who did the work and put it out first. So while I think sharing ideas and like once you've done all you can with an idea or you've done what you want to do with an idea and you put it out there and you say, here you go, Um, have fun with it that's fine but if you're stealing an idea from someone and it's not out there if someone said no this is my idea I need to keep this to me for a little bit so I can do something with it and then we're going to share it if they're doing no it's my idea if you then go no I want that idea that is I think wrong so yes academia it's long-winded long-winded answer to your question but yes academia is a bad place for it because people are, are stealing things before they're published before they're public domain before people have said here's the idea go and play with it um and i think that's that's wrong personally 
Okay, so it goes back to conduct behaviours, yes. um, really, in, in terms of what you're raising there. It's more of yeah. a conduct issue that someone's stealing something, you've shared in confidence, and they're, they're running off and they're doing whatever they want to do. Yeah. So moving on from that, um, in terms of where you are at this moment in time, so are you planning to be a professor or are you going out there into the industrial world? Uh, not going to be a professor. Um, <laughs> that, that would involve staying in academia, and I've, I've made my views on that clear earlier. Uh, yeah. No, so I'm, I'm not going to stay in academia, and I've, I've sort of explained my reasons for me not staying in academia. Mm -hmm. There are lots of reasons to stay in academia. Like I said, there's for travel, there's for the people that you meet, there's places you can go, there's... Uh, and, and just doing research, like putting, putting ideas out there is rewarding in its own right. You know, there's, there's lots of... Lots of good points about academia, but I've said it's not for me. Um, I was thinking at one point of becoming a full-time entertainer. I've been supporting myself doing magic uh, for a number of years. Um, in my, it was sort of like the gap year between masters and PhD. And while I've been doing my PhD, um, because London is expensive and you cannot afford to live there on just a PhD stipend. Excuse me. Um, but with COVID and with the way things are at the moment, there, there's just no way that I can make enough money to support myself. And there's no consistency in the money that's coming in. Like one month, I could be getting two, three thousand pounds. The next month, I could be getting eight hundred pounds. And like that sort of inconsistency is making things difficult. Uh, so at the moment, I am currently applying for jobs um, in the public and private sectors uh, as a researcher, as a uh, software developer or engineer, as a data analyst, as some, something along those sort of lines which um, fit my skills. And it's still difficult. Um, applying for jobs is very hard. I got a number of years of coding and programming experience as a PhD researcher. I've got a number of, uh, you know, I've got a lot of experience as a PhD researcher. Um, I've spent a lot of time working on communication skills and feel, and I've won awards for scientific communication. I've, you know, I've, I've won three awards for scientific communication. I've won the Leicester Magic Circle close-up competition. So I've, you know, I've won at least four awards for my ability to communicate ideas and to talk to people. And even with the ability to talk to and communicate ideas and to do the research and to do the mathematical coding and to do all the sorts of different bits and pieces that people have said to me will make you very employable, it's still very difficult to find a job. I'm still getting rejections left, right and centre and people not being interested, getting a few people interested, but it's, you know, it's, slow going and it's very difficult. So even having a PhD is, is in this climate anyway, is no guarantee of being able to get a job. No, I agree. I mean, COVID-19 has affected the, you know, the, the world in, in, in various ways, especially in terms of working wise, a lot of people have been made redundant, um, not to make any excuses in that sense. And, you know, the competition is quite high in that sense, but in, 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 in to round off in terms of what we've, discussed today I mean you've mentioned a, a few things there that I think are very important for anybody who's currently in you know starting off or in the middle of their PhD or getting to the end in terms of things that they need to um, consider and think about and reflect on and also be aware of so thank you very much in terms of sharing but when it comes to to behavior and conduct and you know people stealing ideas I think it's it's more of a, a people's issue <laughs> I mean we can't get away from that I mean I, I could tell you today you know I'm going to build this A B C D and if you've got the money and I'm still applying for funding you know chances are you will go ahead because you believe in it and you think he'll give you an income so in in that sense I think I agree to 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 disagree to a certain extent I mean I'm not at that level yet where I'm now sharing my ideas maybe <laughs> when I get to that point I'll be crying and calling yeah. you for advice bear in mind though as well to do a PhD you need to do an original piece of research 
And if you spend a year of your PhD doing an original piece of research and you then tell someone about it in confidence and they go and publish it, you've then wasted a year of your PhD, which you cannot use in your thesis because it's now no longer original research. It's been stolen. It's been done by someone else. So it still applies to people as a PhD student as well. Um, so first conference I went to, uh, I, so second time I went to a conference, I was giving a talk and my supervisor, when I was doing a talk, said to me, right, Alex, you can talk about this bit of your research. You can talk about how we're getting the patterns to like look at each other like this. Right. Can't, so you can get, you can, I can talk. So if this is like the, the test pattern mm -hmm. and this is the pattern that we've said is close enough. I can talk about getting to that point, but because this is important for my PhD and because this research needs to stay confidential, I can't talk about going from this bit to that bit. Right. Um, because someone could steal the idea and then I'll have wasted two years of my PhD. So it's not just a people issue. It is, an, it is an issue that affects PhD students. It's an issue that affects researchers. It's an issue that is, I think, a significant problem, especially if you've spent... 10 years working on, on an idea and you tell someone about it uh, down the pub and may then go and steal it and do it in six months. That's your career down the drain. You're 10 years gone. They get, they get publication. You then can't use that research. You can't use that idea. And you might not then be able to keep your job. I think it's perhaps more of an issue than... I'm happy to agree to disagree if you want to, but I'm, I think it's more of an issue than what you're saying it is. No, I mean, I, I, I fully comprehend what you're saying. I guess due to lack of experience from my perspective, um, I can't definitely say, do you know what? Yes, you are right, you know, with, with both hands on my chest. However, from hearing what the problem is, I'm thinking if in those who are thinking of ideas, I mean, with, with um, you know, with Tesla, I'm sure he shared a few things and, you know, people said their points in terms of what would make, you know, Tesla great in that sense. That's why we all want a Tesla, <laughs> you know, in, in, in that aspect. When you talk to people, you know, you, he you hear their viewpoints and it makes you think outside the box, essentially. So that's where I'm coming from is I haven't got that experience yet. Hence why I'm saying what I'm think, saying. There's nothing wrong with sharing ideas with people that you trust in order to, you know, get you to think outside the box. That, that is fine and that does happen. And collaborations like that that are mutually beneficial happen and everyone involved gets the credit. The issue that I've got is that you might just be telling someone what you're researching. They might just be like interested. Oh, what are you researching? Oh, I'm looking at this. Oh, how are you doing that? Oh, like blah, 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 blah oh, that's cool, well, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. And then the next day they go and they publish a paper that's, that's the, the work that you've been doing for two years. That's where the problem is, when it's mm -hmm. copying and stealing your work, not taking an idea and improving it or saying, oh, that's cool, why don't you try doing this instead? As opposed to, oh, that's cool, I'm going to steal that and have that. But that's that's a sort of difference. Um, and I think that's what you said that, you know, is good about Tesla is told people and they've gone, oh, well, why don't you try this instead? And that's fine. But it's not, uh, but it's not the same as, right, okay, oh, I've heard Tesla next door is building an electric car. You know what? I've got a spare battery lying around. I'm going to build an electric car first. You know, it's, it's not that. It's not a, oh, Tesla, it's a difference between, oh, Tesla next door is building an electric car. Electric car. I've got a battery and some motors and an idea. I'll take them around to his and we'll sit down and we'll have a cup of tea and I'll, I'll explain my ideas and this, that and the other. It, you know, that's, that's good. But oh, I hear Tesla's building an electric car. I'm going to get there first. I've got a motor. I've got, I've got some motors. I've got a battery. I'm going to build it first. That's stealing and that's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. And, and it's the second thing that happens a lot in academia. It's the stealing bit that happens a lot in academia. It's not the, 
it's not that, oh, I hear Tesla's building a car, I'm going to go around there and, and give him some ideas and, you know, say, you know, offer my help. It's, uh, oh, I hear he's building an electric car, I'm going to take it. That's, that's what happens in academia and that's what's wrong. I agree with that. Um, you know, the more you explain it, I guess, I can see the, the pain when you've worked really hard um, on something and someone just mm-hmm. overnight does what you've just said there. So yeah. I will agree with that. Um, but it's not to say that it's not um, present in, in, you know, in the industry world. So it is but something that is there. Sorry? Just because it is present in an industry world doesn't mean it should be present in an industry world. <laughs> Essentially, yes, you are accurate in saying that. But it is um, an issue that is present. It, it is an issue, but it's it's not that one sole reason that I've chosen to leave academia. It's yes. that and all of the red tape. And um, so I know someone who was trying to do an experiment and mm. had money in the bank account to do this experiment. And they'd sourced all of these parts and uh they they needed they just needed the university to say yes you can use your own money to do this thing and they ended up having to send like an email chain to about seven different people to get access to this money and then they said oh actually you can't use that supplier because it's not one of our recommended suppliers our recommended supplier doesn't have the stuff that you need for six months so you're going to have to wait six months to do it and they're like no but i can get it for cheaper and the next day from this place, but you can't use that place. You know, there's a lot of red tape and a lot of all of it, you know, all of that goes on and there's um, loads of other issues as, as well. So the toxic work, but the, the working 60 hours a week, the applying for grants, the fact that like 90% of grant applications are rejected, the applying for fellowships and the academic memberships and the sorting out conferences and uh, all, all of that sort of thing. There's lots of things that have added up and that is just a, a sort of small part of it. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Mm. So any, um, you know, wise words for those who are feeling the way that you're feeling at the moment or felt um, when you graduated? Um, don't give up. Um, <laughs> no, uh, more than that though. If if you, I would say prioritize yourself over your PhD. Prioritize your mental health over your PhD. Um, throughout my time as a as a PhD candidate, I went to counselling. I my my university offered four three counselling sessions a year, and I used four in one year and one the next year. Um, don't be afraid to do that. Don't be afraid to if you're having a slump in your research, you're better off stopping, going home, having a day or two off, having a weekend off, going away, you know, going going away for a week, going back to your parents for a week, relaxing, switching off from your PhD, and then coming back to it refreshed, you're better off doing that than just trying to work through it. So take care of yourself more than anything else. Um, and remember that there are going to be days that you don't do anything. I had months where just nothing happened or very little progress happened. In fact, I had six months of working on a problem. And then I realized after six months of trying to work out this problem, I'd been looking at it slightly wrong and then I could do it a different way. And it was, it was done within a week. You, yeah, you have fits and starts. So don't let it get you down. Look after yourself, look after your mental health. Um, and don't be afraid to talk to people about it is what I would say. But not your research, don't talk about your research because someone will stay. Uh, talk about your mental health. <laughs> way forward, way forward. So thank you very much um, for your time today and for sharing um, you know, about your research and also your journey and where you are now in terms of the next steps. So uh, thank you very much. Um, hopefully it will help someone out there. Uh, if it helps one person, it will be useful, won't it? So fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Thank you very much. No problem at all. Right. Shall we stop the recording? Yes.